In the previous chapter, we saw how, with less than two weeks to go before the start of Neil Hamilton and the lobbyist Ian Gray's 1996 libel trial, the Guardian's solicitor, Geraldine Proudler, requested that Gray supply the names of all the MPs to whom he'd given commission payments for introducing new clients. In this chapter, we'll see how Proudler's request started a chain of events more fitting of an implausible tragedy or farce. As we discussed, Gray subsequently disclosed the names Michael Grills, Neil Hamilton and, to the Guardian's undoubted mortification, Michael Brown, thus destroying the Guardian's planned defence, leaving the Guardian's editor, Alan Rusbridger, and his colleagues with a simple choice. Either throw in the towel and cough up £10 million plus costs for which they had no insurance, or else go for broke and ask the Guardian's lawyers, Geraldine Proudler and Geoffrey Robertson QC, to approach fired for new witnesses to shore up their defence. They chose the latter, criminal, option. But while Proudler and Robertson dealt with the Guardian's calamity in their own way, they discovered something in Ian Gray's paperwork which would also cause mayhem in the Gray-Hamilton camp. The papers showed that Gray had given Michael Grills not three commission payments, as Gray had told the Members' Interest Committee in April 1990, but at least six. In his book, One Man's Word, Ian Gray recalls what happened. It was Tuesday, exactly a week before the trial was due to start, when we first heard that they had come across something for which we could not find an immediate explanation. Andy Stevenson of Carter Rook, that's Hamilton's and Greer's solicitor, telephoned Andrew Smith. That's IGA's managing director. They've been on about working papers and quite a few payments to Michael Grill's MP. Can you explain them? I was busy doing a million and one things elsewhere. No, Andrew Smith could not explain them. He knew only of the three commission payments I had told the select committee about back in 1990. Two days later, I found myself in a morning meeting in our council's chambers with my entire legal team. For once in my life, I did not have an answer. The Guardian had discovered at least six payments to Michael Grills. I'm not saying you've done anything wrong, Ian, leading counsel Richard Ferguson explained, but this is very serious. Although it has nothing to do with cash for questions, it will damage your credibility. If you said three to the select committee, and it's more than three, they will seek to make mincemeat out of you in the box. To have given wrong information to a select committee is serious. Gray pleaded. My staff had told me three, and I had said three. I was careless in not having checked the figures personally. It was a genuine mistake. The fact was that I could have said 23 to the select committee, and it would not have made any difference. I was now to pay the price for my carelessness. The Guardian's lawyers would use this mistake to crucify me, I was told. My chances of winning my action in court had suddenly gone from 90% to zero. I stared at the three legal faces, staring back at me. You should drop the case, was their verdict. And so Gray says that he told them that he would withdraw. He says that the next morning he'd a change of heart and wanted to continue, but it was too late. Events had been set in motion. The barrister who acted for both Gray and Hamilton in what was a joint or consolidated action, remember, was Richard Ferguson QC. A few months later, he gave his impartial account of what happened in a letter to Sir Gordon Downey's parliamentary inquiry. He wrote, On Thursday the 26th of September 1996 and Friday the 27th of September, I had conferences in my chambers with my junior, Miss Victoria Sharp, my solicitor, and Mr. and Mrs. Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton was appraised of the most recent disclosures in the ongoing discovery affecting Mr. Gray's claim. 
These seem to indicate that Mr Greer had underestimated the extent of his payments to MPs and might well have misled the Parliamentary Committee. Both Mr and Mrs Hamilton were outraged at what they regarded as a culpable lack of frankness by Mr Greer. They took the view that he had seriously jeopardised their prospects of success. They were extremely annoyed that they had been encouraged to proceed with the litigation, ignorant of these matters. They expressed their disgust in very strong terms. It seemed to me that the strength of their feelings and the manner in which they expressed them made it impossible to continue to represent both clients. I expressed this concern to my solicitor. He was in complete agreement. Instructions were withdrawn. In effect, this meant we could take no further part in the proceedings. This left Hamilton and Greer saddled with legal bills of £200,000 apiece, with the task of having to find a further £100,000 each to brief new separate legal teams, with the trial merely days away. And so, both Greer and Hamilton agreed that they would have no option but to settle. Whether Greer would have fought on is open to question, but there's no doubt that Hamilton was forced to withdraw for reasons that had nothing to do with the strength of his case. From the evidence we discuss coming next in Chapter 14, it's certain that, had Proudler and Robertson known about the disarray in their opponent's camp, they wouldn't have let the three new witness statements out of their sight. But they didn't know, and by the time they found out, it was already too late. They'd been dispatched. According to David Lee's account in Slees, and on this there's no reason to disbelieve him, Fire delivered the three new witness statements to the Guardian's solicitors, Oswang, during the afternoon of Friday, September the 27th. Lee states... On Friday afternoon, a man appeared in the marbled lobby of the first Chicago building, where Oldswang is based, wearing green regalia, braid and buttons. This was Rodney, aged 82, the longest serving employee of Harrods store. Rodney was Fyatt's personal messenger, and on Friday the 27th of September, he had a package, which he insisted on delivering personally to Miss Geraldine Proudler, on the chairman's authority. The parcel did not contain a giant teddy bear this time. It contained the three signed witness statements taken by the lawyer Marvin, corroborating the cash payments to Hamilton. Euphoria, said Proudler, was starting to set in. Lee then describes how Guardian editor Alan Rusbridger and senior Guardian staff Brian Whitaker arrived at Allswang to discuss the case and that some time later, Geraldine Proudler received a telephone call from The Guardian's barrister, Geoffrey Robertson. Lee states, When Robertson eventually rang in, at 5.55pm on Friday the 27th of September, it was with momentous news. Proudler put him on the speakerphone for The Guardian editors to hear. He said he had just had the most extraordinary phone conversation with Richard Ferguson, the tough Ulsterborn QC for Hamilton and Greer. I was just ringing him to warn him of the new evidence coming his way, said Robertson. Suddenly, the QC reported Ferguson had interrupted to ask whether there was any chance of both parties walking away from the trial, each party paying their own costs. He had revealed that a conflict of interest had arisen, which had required him to consult the Bar Council. It was a startling development, and this had happened before they had seen the new witness statements from Harrods. Ferguson, said Robertson, doesn't even want to read them. However, the three new witness statements had already been dispatched, and with Hamilton's and Greer's solicitors less than a mile away, were quite probably being delivered as Robertson and Ferguson were talking on the telephone. Such exquisite timing is a stuff of legend. Within the space of a few seconds, the die had been cast irreversibly, and the history books were set to record, as fact, Alison Bozek, 
Iris Bond and Philip Bromfield as the principal witnesses in the political scandal that's helped bring down the government and solid Parliament's reputation around the world. In a few minutes time, in chapter 15, we will finally begin our work exposing the lies and forgeries behind the most expansive press cover-up ever to be documented. But first, in chapter 14, coming next, we need to see how the Guardian behaved during the subsequent Downey inquiry. Specifically, to see how the Guardian dealt with the fact that the third MP who'd received a commission payment was not Tim Smith, but Michael Brown. And we also need to observe the truly incriminating manner in which the Guardian's senior staff and lawyers related to their three new star witnesses on whose testimony their cash for question story now depended. <laughs>